These assets have the most upside potential in 2023, according to our next guest, John Fennec, portfolio manager and consultant of John Fennec Consulting. Welcome to my show, John. Pleasure to host you today. Thanks a lot, David. Congratulations on your uh, new show and uh, all your success. Thank you. Q1 2023 has been a fantastic year for equities. The NASDAQ, for example, has seen its best quarter since 2020. Are we due for a reversal in the equity markets is my first question to you, John. Yes, we are. At some point this year, most likely in the second half of this year, uh, I think the broad market will give back quite a bit. Um, by quite a bit, I mean, you know, a 10 to 12 percent correction is not out of, the, out of the question from these elevated levels in many of the uh, U.S. indices that we track. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at the, the Fed watch tool right now, David, we're seeing an 86 percent probability of a Fed hike again, May 3rd, which we can talk a little bit more about in terms of the Fed. But, you know, that to me is is sort of like not the same kind of uh, sentiment we saw from the markets in March, where people were expecting uh, you know, nothing really on March 22nd. They got a quarter point hike. Now they're expecting a pause May 3rd, and you've got an 86% probability of another 25 basis point hike. So as you, you know, I went back to our show in September that you referenced on Kitco, and, and I looked at our notes, and one of the themes that I had mentioned uh, was that the Fed had been hawkish pretty much all year. Um, that theme has continued, and um, I think we're getting really close to a pause and really close to a cut down the road. But right now, you have to look at every single meeting as we go along because the Fed has really you know, put it out there that they're data dependent. Just a note on rate hikes, John. It seems that the next rate hike on May 3rd, a 25 basis point hike, has already been priced in by the markets. Is that correct? I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, and, and that would be counter to what I've been telling you since we started uh, these interviews probably you know, around January of last year, right? Where I said the, the Fed got really hawkish January 5th of last year. Uh, we thought that they would hike, you know, as, as early as March of 2022. They did. You asked me in June of 2022, my outlook, I said it's going to be a hawkish year. Uh, we were correct, right? And so when when you're managing, you know, risk in a portfolio, you have to see uh, how, okay, so I want to take some exposure here, but I don't want to put all of my eggs in at this point because, if I'm wrong and the Fed is hawkish, it's going to be a difficult year for metals and mining. And that's exactly what we saw last year. You know, we saw when we last interviewed in September, you know, gold was at 1715. I had mentioned to you that 1675 was some support there, but if it broke that, that you could see 1575 to 1600, and we bounced right off of 1615 twice or three times. So again, technical analysis really matters because all these big portfolio managers and traders are looking at these different you know, uh, levels, correct? And we have skyrocketed from 1615 gold all the way to 2063 recently, um, which is I think the third highest weekly close ever um, that we just saw here recently. So you know, gold is in a serious uptrend. A lot of that is predicated on what happened beginning March 8th, which we can get into a little bit with the financial markets. Yeah, I want to come back to your macro outlook, but let's talk about gold first. So same sure. question that I asked about the stock markets, I'm going to extend to the gold market. Uh, gold and equities have both rallied together in tandem in Q1, which is, I don't want to say rare, but it's not, it's not often they move together. Usually gold is seen as a hedge against volatility, but this year so far they've both gone up. Gold has breached $2,000. Is it time for a trend reversal for gold as well? We could easily see it pull back to the 1950 kind of mark, I believe, um, but that's not detrimental in the, in the chart whatsoever, right? So you have to look at 1615 held really nicely, then 1790 to 1800 held really nicely. Uh, now you're going to make a higher low than 1790 in our view if you have a decline here. And so 1900 to 1950 is, is, a, is an area to watch. Um, but if you look at the RSI, the relative strength index on gold right now as we speak, because we've had a pretty significant pullback over the last two days, the RSI on gold is 55. So it's not really overextended. It got really overextended you know, a week ago when we were crossing that 2050 mark. Before we get into uh, specific commodities, generally speaking this year then, uh, what's your market outlook? Which assets or asset classes do you think will perform the best? Well, I'm biased, okay? So there, there, there's a... 
the disclosure there in that I run an energy portfolio and I run a mining portfolio. So I don't have much market much money in the broad market at all. Uh, in fact, I'm short a lot of things, uh, you know, so I, I really don't uh, think like something like technology is going to rally uh, further, right? Much, much further past, you know, let's call it June 30th. I think the second half is going to be a comeuppance for a lot of sectors that have run for many, many years. You have to look at a chart going back to March of 09 to really understand the kind of growth we've had in the broad market, right? I, I would recommend all your listeners to do that. Before putting any money in the broad market, look at the growth we've seen in the last 14 years, almost to the day, right? Um, but your question was what I think would do well. Obviously, I think mining is going to do well now because of March 8th. I think gold and silver related equities are going to do extremely well. That was like as close to a bell ringing in the background as you're going to get, right? Because we had Silvergate go out March 8th. We had Silicon Valley go out March 9th. Uh, Signature went out on that Sunday, two days later. I mean, I, you know, when you saw Lehman go out in 08, it wasn't like a string of things happening right away. It took weeks, right? So this is very interesting to me. And it, it's very interesting also that people don't know history it shows me that there's a lot of uh greed out there in the markets and um, there's really nothing else you could call it right it's like you have to be there now to answer your question also about why gold is running at the same time i think we could just you know answer it this way there's people like myself and a lot of other people that are like okay i respect that 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 happened now and i'm going to buy more gold and silver right and there's a contingent of investors that say well hey that was just a couple of small banks this isn't JP Morgan or Wells Fargo or anything. So we're just going to keep piling into the broad markets, right? We're definitely in the first camp. So John, maybe we could just talk about your top picks and um, your top overweights in your own personal portfolio and give us your thesis around why you're overweight energy and certain commodities. Sure. Um, so I, I like to try to mention a few names that we mentioned on our last show because it was seven months ago. And I think it would give some of your listeners an idea of how we invest. So, you know, we talked about four names. One was Golden Minerals, which is uh, ticker AUMN. We mentioned it at 25 cents on your show back then, and it's at 26 cents now. So really not uh, what we had expected from the company, but we mentioned on that interview that their uh, second largest project at Valardania in Mexico was delayed because silver had not done well as a commodity, right? The price of silver wasn't high enough for them to make an economic uh, decision on that uh, former producing mine. So now that's changed. If you look at their news flow about seven to 10 days ago, they basically said, we've got a workaround for Bellardania for this year. Uh, the stock went up seven cents over the course of two or three days on that news and has since come back down a bit. But this is a great entry point because in talking to the CEO, you know, one of our things, David, is talking to people about public news and saying, can you please clarify this for us? Warren Rain, the CEO, said this is the best news we've had in, in 18 to 24 months. I mean, the market kind of got that idea. But for us, we've been you know sitting on the bid to buy more because we think that the company has got bright prospects now um, being a heavy, heavy you know silver and gold type play. We also talked about Vendetta on your old show, uh, VDTAF. We talked about it at three cents. It's now at 0 0.059. It's almost doubled. Um, we said, and we're always very careful about talking about any type of percentage gains or losses, but we actually said on your program, we think this could be up 50 to 100% in the next year, and it's up almost 100% right now. Um, another one that's done quite well is Idaho Champion Gold. We said that at uh, 4.1 cents on your show, and it's now an even 8 cents. So again, a 90-something percent gain in seven months. And so when you look at these names, they're, they're bigger percentages for us, right? Uh, Idaho Champion is about a 4.5% weight. Vendetta is about a 6% weight. So part of, the, part of the thing that we teach investors, David, is when you overweight something, it's because you have more conviction in it. You know the management better. You have you know, looked at the whole project and, and, and you feel comfortable with the risk you're taking. There's a lot of factors that go into the buys, but we don't just do an even weight portfolio, right? Where we're going to say, we're going to buy 50 mining stocks and put 2% in each one. That's really lazy in our opinion. So we we basically will do the work to overweight certain things and underweight other things. A lot of these names are base metals companies. Are you playing a, sort of a theme, an industrial theme right now? Or are you just going bottom up and picking companies 
that have strong company fundamentals, regardless of the underlying commodities they're producing or yeah, invested in? Great question. Our track record on our website is not all gold and silver. We compete with a lot of people that are gold and silver all day long. But we, you know, Vendetta is lead and zinc. Um, Idaho Champion is lithium and cobalt in addition to gold, right? So we are looking at what is the best opportunity as value managers. We're not always concerned with the commodity unless the commodity is really in a downturn like palladium right now. We backed off on some of our buys on palladium because we want to see it get some traction first, right? I think in my heart it's going to happen, but I want to see the chart firm up before we start, you know, putting more money into those equities. I want to ask you about some some uh, specific commodities now, and uh, and we can discuss why they've moved like the way they have, and perhaps what's next. The first that uh, I want to bring up is actually natural gas. Um, sure. As you know, a huge increase in the price over the last year or so, and then it's basically collapsed down from uh, ten dollars per uh, British thermal unit down to two, and that's the decline of about eighty percent. <laughs> yeah, what natural gas has been very difficult to get right. Um, if I remember correctly, when we last interviewed, there were a lot of people that took, you know, kind of a different stance than us that, hey, this is going to be a really cold winter. You know, this is in September of last year. And, and because of the problems that Russia was creating, we're going to see a shortage of natural gas globally, right? That's one way to play it or think about it, I guess. But we were just in observe mode. We put a really small position into this thing called GAZ, which is a natural gas ETF that tracks the price of natural gas without a K1. So it doesn't have you know, negative tax ramifications for investors. Um, but we did that around 25 or 27. And uh, the high was around 53. So we figured, hey, 50% off, we're going to put a little position on it. I mean, little, like a couple thousand dollars. Because like some investors, we like to put something, you know, a little money to work, put it on our screen, make us, you know, look at it, look at it a little harder. Um, well, since then, we haven't bought it again. And it's now an even $11. So to your point, things can get cheaper. And what is driving that? I, I'm not a natural gas expert. I try to cover all the commodities as best as I can. But I can just say, as a chartist, you have to respect the chart and see that this is in a serious decline. The, the, the um, silver lining, however, is that it seems to be bottoming right now. So, you know, we're, we're getting more interested in buying some more here and lowering our cost basis, right? We don't do things, you know, we tell investors all the time, you have to buy multiple times. We do the same thing. We're not going to tell someone to do something like that and not do it ourselves. Crude oil, is that just a prediction on the global economic slowdown or are there specific uh, micro events that prevented gold or oil rather from going higher last year? There was a lot of back and forth regarding OPEC, and I think there's some more clarity there now. And the recent news with OPEC was bullish for oil. Um, there's a number of different you know, oil trackers you can buy out there. I would just caution people again that some of them do produce a K1. So try to find something that doesn't if you don't want that uh, hassle at tax time. But you know, really, it's, it's, it's a, probably a next to one to two years looks pretty good for energy in our view. And we're just starting to buy some names there, David. We're not uh, jumping over our skis to to just buy anything at any price because a lot of the larger names have already made a nice move, right? So we're kind of hoping for a pullback and some higher quality type names. Um, but as equity managers, we're more you know more interested in buying some stocks. If I were to let's say reverse engineer a scenario for you, such that the oil price spikes back up to one hundred twenty dollars a barrel again, uh, mm -hmm. what would that scenario be? Well. I, I don't really know what that scenario would be. Um, I'm, I'm never going to say something like that far out, you know, because that, that you know, is like saying gold goes to 3,000, right? Like if gold goes to 3,000, all of my portfolio is going to do extremely well. I mean, you have to be positioned in things in advance of a big move, right? Like I didn't see March 8th happening. I think anyone that would tell you that is, is, is to, to the extent that it did happen, you know, with three or four different bankruptcies in, in a matter of a week, would be a liar, right? Like, I mean, I, I've, I've said on your show before in other shows last year that I thought the financial sector was under some strain. But to see that happen like this was really opening, uh, eye opening for me, you know, as well. So the question then becomes if you've had a position in something like oil stocks pre a move in, in, in oil price uh, or, or gold stocks pre gold you know, move. Um, good for you. You've you put some money to work, but is it enough, right? So like I always tell people, 
you have to do the homework, you have to do the research and get a position in when it feels uncomfortable. Right now, to me, oil doesn't feel uncomfortable, right? It looks decent. Um, that gas feels uncomfortable, right? <laughs> uh, silver still feels uncomfortable for some. I mean, these are the things as value managers that we look at and we're more interested in. Generally speaking, though, let's close off on commodities and we'll get to your um, stock picking strategies. But uh, generally speaking, which commodity do you think will outperform this year versus the other ones? Sure. So silver's had major resistance uh, in the 26 and a half to 28 range. Uh, it just crossed 26, I believe, April 13th for the first time in many, many weeks, um, but pulled back since then. Uh, so I think once you get through 26.50 to 28 on silver, you're going to see $30, which is that really big resistance level tested. Uh, and if you break 30 to the upside uh, on a close or two, you're going to have massive buying in silver equities. And we've said that on your show and a few others last year. We also were in the camp that you would not hit 30 last year, which never even came close to happening. Um, and I think that uh, a, a close above 30, like I said a few times, is going to bring in 35 really quick. So silver has a lot of upside in our view. Uh, and given what happened March 8th, I think it, it, it's just a matter of time before silver starts to really move. Uh, the, so the gold to silver ratio is still very stretched in our view. Outside of that, you know, um, we've already touched on natural gas. I, I'm looking at palladium for some type of entry points. Uh, I think that, you know, 84% of the world's palladium is still made in two suspect, you know, suspect countries in South Africa because of all the strikes and Russia because of the obvious so when you look at palladium, it, it, it does have a supply um, issue potentially going forward. And uh, one that has done really well quietly, David, uh, for some is copper. You know, copper has really looked good since last July. Um, and we've mentioned that on a number of shows that, you know, the, the supply of copper is not what, what the average investor thinks out there. And prices have remained above that $4 a pound level for the most part in, in recent weeks. The gold silver ratio is that something you looked at, and what uh, do you think that ratio could change and compress to a historical low of let's say fifty or sixty? I mean, we're about eighty right now. You hear that from a lot of people. Uh, I, I'm not in the fifty to one camp. No, um, eventually yes, but not right away. I mean, it's going to take months for us to get there, maybe, unless we see more bank declines. Right? If we if we get that. You know, a really outside event. I mean, Credit Suisse surprised a lot of people. If we get some larger names to go out, uh, yeah, silver is going to catch up to gold pretty quickly. But right now, we're still in that. You know, I, I haven't looked at it today, so I'm gonna. I don't want to misspeak, but let's say 80 to one, 82 to one kind of ratio. And if that's the case, it's still very elevated, and there's there's room for silver to run. Give us some um, pointers as to how to pick stocks. So let's take one of the stocks that you mentioned that you like a company, and maybe walk us through some of the qualitative and quantitative aspects that you will need to screen for before deciding whether or not to purchase the stock. Sure. So our first screen is always management. And I get that wrong sometimes, like anyone else. Um, we had uh, two companies that, you know, we held very small positions in last year that, that, that aren't around today, you know, uh, and by, by small, I mean, 0.1 and 0.4% respectively. So you can make mistakes. The key, as we said earlier today, is that you make small mistakes, right? You don't have 5 or 6% of your portfolio in something like that. You have 0.4 or 0.1%, right? But when you get lied to by management, you, there's no screen for that, right? You just have to have a good nose for that. And after speaking with CEOs since 2000, um, well, really 2008 in this space, when I started to really hit the phones, um, I've, I've known, you know, Keith Newmeyer for 15 years. I've known Mitch Krebs for 15 years. I've known a lot of these people for a long time. So they've built trust with me over time and I feel more comfortable owning their stock as a result, right? Um, if you don't have the time to do that yourself, then buy my newsletter, buy someone else's newsletter, buy someone else's process. Like you have to be able to spend a little money to, um, to, you know, not do the work yourself. Right. Um, but that's number one. Number two is, is to me, the share structure means a lot, right? Like when you look at 600 million, 800 million shares outstanding, sometimes it's, it's really hard for that stock to get a move up, even in good times, because there's so many sellers potentially out there. 
and or there's just a lot of options and warrants on the on the company, right? That is also what we call an overhang potentially on the stock price. It doesn't always happen though, David, and, and I don't mean to contradict myself. I'm just saying that's where the management call comes in, right? I remember this stock Copper Lake that I got into about, I don't know, three years ago at a penny and a half. And I called the company and I said, there's nothing on your website breaking down those warrants for me. Can you tell me who owns those warrants and options? And they came back to me with a spreadsheet, you know, within, I don't know, a few minutes and just said, here's here's the majority of the ownership. And it was all the board and managers and geos and people that aren't selling at ridiculously low prices, right? So that's where doing the extra homework really matters. Um, jurisdiction has become increasingly important since you and I met a few years ago, right? I mean, if we had said Chile, Peru, Nicaragua, all these places were going to be problematic in 2022, you and I would have probably said, I, I don't really buy that, but that's exactly what happened. And I think you're going to continue to have problems in jurisdictions um, that may surprise people, including parts of Canada and the U.S. So you have to be in touch with management to understand what the risks are there. Um, another thing we don't like is single single minds, uh, you know, single project kind of companies. Because if you have only one project, there's a lot that could go wrong there, right? Um, you're seeing that with Trilogy and other companies recently where they have a lot of their um, uh, their big assets in one part and that is experiencing some type of problem that is really not even their fault, but it's still putting the, you know a lot of pressure on shares. So those are just a few of the screens we look for, but we also coach people on how to buy. And we don't tell people, buy this stock at this price. That's advice. We're basically saying, we're not going to get over our skis in November and December, David, and go out there and you know buy at any price, right? Or even put market orders in. We're putting limit orders out there. So to use Golden Minerals as an example, we talked about that at 26 cents. If you wanted to buy that tomorrow, I'd buy it at 0.2601. I'm not going to go out there at 0.28 uh, at, you know, at the market open and pay an 8% premium just because I'm lazy. You know, you have to sit out there with with a limit order for maybe you know a couple days before you can get filled, right? Um, you know, meaning that if the current price action is 26 bid and 27 ask, I'm out there at 2301, 2401. I'm just saying. Come here, big seller. You know, sell into my to my to my buy price, right? And that way, you have more control over your blended cost basis. Finally, John, maybe um, impart some wisdom as to some of the trading mistakes or investing mistakes that you've made before uh, that perhaps people are still repeating today, and <laughs> what you've learned from these mistakes. Yeah, um, I've made a lot of mistakes over the course of time, and everyone has, whether they like to admit it or not. I mean, I was heavily invested in tech stocks as a, as a 30 year old in 2000, 2001. And I, um, you know, took it on the chin and I went to my broker and I said, what can I do to protect my assets here? Because whatever we're doing isn't working. And he said, you should buy some physical gold and physical silver, and you should learn how to short stocks. And so I've been shorting stocks on and off for 23 years as a result of that. Um, and, I've also been in the metals and mining space for 23 years. To be fair, I owned mostly physical metal from 2000 to 2008. And when the crisis happened, I started to get more interested in the equities because they had been so bombed out, right? And so we've seen that kind of bombed out um, uh, experience in mining stocks pretty much on eight-year intervals, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, that period of time, January of 2016. And then again, right here in 2023, you like really starting to take off again. And you get these what we call thrust moves in certain stocks. And that's a very rare event. And it's actually happening as we speak in GDX and GDXJ. So there's a lot of things to be excited about in the mining space right now, as bad as it's been, you know, for a couple of years since the August of 2020 highs. Um, another, you know, a couple of mistakes for your listeners. Um is to use market orders as opposed to limit orders, right? You know, when you first start out, you may just, you know, have uh, FOMO and want to get a stock in your in your portfolio. But you've got to be patient. Patience is a virtue, right? So you sit out there with a buy order that's away from the action. And if you really want the stock, you can go ahead and buy it, you know, with a limit order at today's prices. But putting a market order out there on a junior stock can be really de de detrimental to your overall gains. And why why I say that is, we use gold and minerals as an example. Again, that is traded on the NYSE light exchange. 
So it's got much more liquidity. But if you buy something like in the pinks or the OTC market, well, you know that that bid could be 26, yeah, but the ask could be 31, right? So then if you put a market order in there, you might get something like 30 and the next trade's at 26, right? So like you're already down huge on your on your portfolio just because you you know didn't understand how to place an order. So we tell people, you know, here's what a limit order is, here's what a good till cancel order means, you know, how that works. And um, try to help them a little bit with understanding the basics. Um, but, you know, I, I think another big mistake is is not having skin in the game, right? Because many people now are chasing mining stocks as a result of what's happened March 8th. If you didn't listen to what you and I have been telling people for the last two years, right, which is like this, this sector is quite interesting and there's a lot of upside potential, then you basically are are in chase mode right now. And a lot of these names that have gone up, you know, 20 to 60% probably in the last you know month. Um, and so we're very comfortable with adding two positions, but we want to have skin in the game. And so I encourage people to, you know, if it's not me, go out there and get a newsletter, get some type of, you know, update service, something that's going to help give you some direction and more confidence in buying things. And you, you mentioned you've been shorting stocks. Just curious, you've worked in the financial sector before. Have you been shorting the banks uh, either uh, this year or last year? Yeah, you're, you're good at asking good questions, David. Uh, you know, Wells Fargo is something I'm short. I'm also a client, so it's a little embarrassing. But, uh, you know, I, I am short around 4410 uh, because I still think there's some downside in the stock. Um, I just started to short Santander, SAN. Um, and um, I'm I'm starting. I've, I've shorted the financial sector through an ETF uh, following the crisis. I think four different times. Um, so you know I'm I'm starting to build that you know uh, financial short here because I think there's more pain to come. And I say that because if you read Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO of of, of JP Morgan, if you read his letter to shareholders in April, it's pretty darn negative. And um, it, it basically says in writing, you know, we believe that this is not over, that there's other, you know, problems that we're going to see, despite themselves having a really good quarter uh, on April 14. There, you know, Jamie is pretty negative on certain things that he's seeing in the sector. Are you are you concerned about um, more bank failures, like outright collapses, or just a decline in the share price due to a slowdown in the economy, or perhaps interest rates will stop rising? Well, what's your what's your thesis for? Mm -hmm. shorting the banks besides what Jamie Dimon said? Well, let's take Wells Fargo as an example, okay? I mean, it's something I've tracked for a while. I've been a client for 30 years. Um, you know, uh, the stock hit, I, I believe, 2040 in the pandemic. So three years ago, almost to the day, stock traded up today to 41, right? So you've doubled your money in three years in that stock, just roughly, right? That's a lot of gain, you know, in my view, over the course of three years to make 100% on something, um, there's, there's downside there. Um, because of what's happened with the financial sector, we're not saying the stock's going to revisit 2050. We're not saying the stock's going out of business. Um, and, that, and that's something to clarify, David, is that we don't short things with the idea that this is going from 41 to zero. You know, there's a lot of people out there that do that. We don't do that. We're trying to make some vig in, in that, you know, if a sector is under pressure like financials is right now, it's what we call show me the money, right? Like you're in that show me the money mode with earnings, with everything you're doing. There's a microscope now looking at the financial sector. So we would tend to short something like that to say, what just happened over here with all of these banks? And is it systemic or is is that just, you know, those different companies, right? The answer right now is unclear. So um we don't get greedy with our shorts, you know. Um, last year, our biggest short positions were in retail um, and in uh, travel because we we did, really didn't believe that the travel um, uh, we we believe that people wanted to leave their homes in 2022 and get out there and, and do things. I guess you know we we that wasn't our best short because I underestimated how much airlines and hotels were going to gouge people. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, the price of, of uh, you know, you look at CPI, you break it down. The biggest category of in rise year over year from Jan 1 to Jan 1 is airline tickets. It's up 47% year over year. So when you look at that, that's hitting the, the consumer really, really hard, right? Thank God we haven't shorted any uh, uh, airline stocks. But, 
you know, we did short some hotel stocks where we've made money on some, lost money on others. All right. Well, John, very thorough analysis today. I appreciate you uh, sharing your portfolio with us. And finally, where can we learn more about your work and uh, access your newsletter? Very important. Oh, sure. Yeah. So we launched our newsletter in 2021. It covers all commodities. It's it's a very short uh, kind of format versus some others. Um, and we price it accordingly. We try to work with people on pricing. Um, that's on our website, fenicconsulting.com. And also our performance just got announced uh, for a Q1 uh, over the weekend. So if you check that out, you know, we're about six and a half percent ahead of GDXJ for the quarter. So we're very proud of that. And I think we're going to have a fantastic year this year in our mining portfolio. Congrats. Okay. Well, thank you very much once again for sharing your thoughts with us and uh, for spending time on my program. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank you for watching my show, The David Lynn Report. Stay tuned for more and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>